And uh, one other thing is this. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break today. The reason being uh, we needed to get finished by 12. The career discussion is at 1.15, so uh, it's hard to have all three batches of a student uh, to go through the lunch within, say, 45 minute time. So as usual, the chemists get hungry first, so we get a 15 minute break and we will end at 12 noon, okay? Questions, comments? All right, for now, uh, let me start. What we saw from last time was that there are two types of combustion reactions. One type is known as the metathesis reaction. The metathesis reaction are those that involve typically one transition state directly moving from the reactants to the products. Those are hydrogen abstraction reactions. You send a hydrogen atom, collide it with a methane molecule. This hydrogen atom grabs one of the four hydrogen atoms from methane and go with it. Okay. The second type of reaction we need to worry about are unimolecular reactions. Now, there are two types of unimolecular reactions. One involves simple isomerization, involving internal moving atoms around inside a molecule. The other type of unimolecular reaction is simple dissociation, breaking a carbon-carbon bond or breaking a carbon-hydrogen bond. Therefore, the back reaction is a bimolecular recombination. Bimolecular recombination reaction. The dynamics of kinetics at the detailed level between unimolecular and bimolecular reactions are the same. Grown from this class of reaction are chemically activated reactions. <coughs> that is, the initial addition of two reactants results in a vibrational excited complex. This vibrational excited complex would have enough lifetime for it to survive for perhaps a picosecond, and in some cases, nanosecond and maybe even microsecond. With this excited species, if you don't do anything with it, you will tend to go back to where you start. That's the reactants. But if this excited species collide with another gas molecule, you can stabilize it. Or if stabilization isn't efficient, then this excited molecule may go to an exit channel instead of go back to where it started. That's what's called chemical reactive reaction. Interesting enough, the two most dominant reactions in combustion, H plus O2 chin branching, CO plus OH producing CO2 and H, both are in fact chemically activated. Inherently, both of them would have ray constant that are pressure dependent. Except for, for these two reactions, we are lucky in the sense that the pressure dependence isn't very strong. Okay. Metathesis reaction, for example, you have H2 plus OH producing hydrogen atom and water. All hydrogen abstraction reactions are metathesis reactions. <coughs> What I hope to do this morning is go over basic reaction rate theories describing <coughs> metathesis reaction, that's a transition state theory. Then I move on to the transi transition theory description of a uh, unimolecular reaction and briefly talk about a chemically activated reaction. The content that I'm going to uh, deliver today is rather heavy, so I don't have to go through all of them just to give you a flavor of what will be. Uh, what are the some things you need to know? And consequently, I also, from time to time, I'll give you my view about how do you evaluate ray constant? How do you utilize 
the principles of this theory on deriving better reaction rate constants from very limited experimental data okay, without having to go to uh, do substantial theory. So let me first talk about biomolecular reaction. Collision theory applies to metathesis reaction. It applies to biomolecular recombination reaction. And it certainly applies to the first step in the chemically activated reaction. It's all about collision, collision frequency. How many of you had the collision theory? Almost all of you. So let's go fast, OK? Hard sphere collision. Two molecules, both are described as spheres. They will undergo collision due to random motion. <coughs> Already, If you classify type of collision, you'll find that limiting case being head-on collision. The trajectory of the two, uh, two particles align up, so they'll, go, they'll get this uh, head-on collision. Most of the collisions are off-center. And in a limiting case, you're going to have the first particle just kissing the second particle and it go away. That's the greatest, uh, 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 that's the cross-section area. That's the greatest that will accommodate a collision process. Okay. Suppose the diameter of the first particle is denoted as sigma A, the diameter of the second particle is denoted as sigma B, then what is called a collision cross-section, the radius of this cross-section is a diameter added together divided by two. Okay. And the cross-section area is, of course, pi sigma a b squared. Okay. Now suppose I have a volume denoted by v, and in this volume I have nb number of b molecules. I shall devise a cylinder for one a molecule to sweep through. Okay, So the cross-section area is pi sigma squared. Unfortunately, when I was preparing the lecture notes, Somehow, all my symbols turn themselves into times wrong form. So this p is pi, s is sigma. That, I noticed this morning, there are a couple of other uh, uh, typos. Okay. So you ask the question for a unit time. How many uh, times A would bounce into a B? <coughs> Sorry, a B would bounce with an A <coughs> reside within this cylinder? That's the basic question. So to do that, it's a very logical development. So the number of a collision you're going to have per unit of time is equal to the cross-section area multiplied by the velocity of A. OK? So if you notice, that this velocity is perpendicular to the cross-section. So this is the volume the A molecule swept through. But in this volume, I must have nb number of molecule per unit volume. So that's the number of a b molecule I shall collide by A over the cylindrical volume. OK? Then you ask, well, I don't have just have one A molecule. I have na number of molecule in the system. And multiplying this expression by the number density of A, that must be the total collision rate of A and B. Okay. So this is basically the mean velocity of A, cross-section area, multiplied by the density of both A and B. Now, the B molecule, on the other hand, doesn't sit still. It is moving randomly, too. So this V sub A would have a problem, because if I do the same analysis, swapping A and B, I would have a problem because I would have answers over here. The velocity would be B velocity. In reality, this velocity is the relative velocity between A and B. Okay. So the subsequent analysis essentially involves replacing the A by AB. That's the mean velocity, relative mean velocity between A and B. I will skip through the derivation for mean velocity between two molecules. Those are essentially using statistical mechanical theory and you do triple integration, looking at the translational motion to arrive at the final answer. And at the end, the main velocity of a molecule moving in a free space is 8 kT over pi m, square root of m. Okay. 
And if you evaluate this, plug in the values for uh, temperature, mass, what you'll find that it is at 300 degree Kelvin, uh, you get this velocity roughly around 300 meters per second. Okay. The mean velocity of A is a square root of uh, the sum of square of the two velocities. Uh, you can reduce this down equation and get into a reduced mass. That's mu. Mu is expressed as 1 over in the parentheses, 1 over ma plus 1 over mb. In other words, this uh, reduced mass essentially is to say that the system favors the light atom. If you have two things moving relatively to each other, the lighter one shall move very fast, and that dictates the relative speed. OK? Uh, now you plug this expression into that. Again, this p is a pi. And this p is pi, this s is sigma. You will get this expression for collision rate constant. And it's a unit. It's a cubic centimeter, mole minus to the power of negative 1 divided by second. OK. Now, you can take, do an example for H plus O2 reaction. OK. In this case, collision theory is not specific to the products. We don't care about what products we will find. And the collision diameter for a hydrogen ion is about a 2. Collision diameter for <coughs> oxygen is 3.5 angstrom. And you take the mean of the two, that you get a collision diameter of 2.75. Reduce the mass. You plug this into that expression. Leave the temperature out so you can plug in the temperature later. What you shall find is at a 300 k degree Kelvin, this rate constant is 3.7 times 10 to the 14 cc per mole per second. Okay. Now, go to 1,000 Kelvin, it goes to about, rate, collision rate constant goes to about 7 times 10 to the 14. Now, that essentially gave rise the importance to this rate constant at the upper limit in the unit of a cc per mole per second, around 10 to the 14. All right. We said that all elementary reactions require collision. <coughs> collision has this rate, and therefore no reaction shall exceed the collision limit. If they don't collide, they shall not react. So if you see any bimolecular reaction rate constant exceeding around 5 times 10 to the 14, at with CGS unit, then you know something's wrong. Okay? So collision theory established the upper limit for bimolecular reaction rate constant. Okay? And of course, if you compare the collision rate constant with the actual measured rate constant for H plus O2 chin branching, you see that at uh, 1,000 Kelvin, this is 2.6 times 10 to the 14, which is already very close to 6.7 times 10 to the 14. But at a low temperature, 300 Kelvin, <coughs> this is about a 14 orders of magnitude lower. So something else must be going on. OK. Now, caveat. What are the corrections you have to make? So far, we talked about the collision by assuming the reacting species are hard spheres. They're not. Why are molecules not hard sphere? For several reasons. One is electrostatic interaction, London dispersion force, or in short, van der Waals force plays a role. Now, do you know the origin of van der Waals force? Or rather, origins. The van der Waals force is responsible for the fact that I can write on this board. An interaction of the chalk with the board is a van der Waals force in nature. It has two parts, the repulsive part and the, in the, and the short uh, interaction, and attractive interaction in the long distance. The short interaction is due to electron-electron repulsion. You squeeze electron clouds between two atoms or two molecules too close to each other. They repel against each other. The long-range interaction is because of oscillating dipole. Think about it, you have one atom, you have another atom. The electrons spin around the atom. It's a dynamic. It's a wave function, constantly undergo oscillation, departure from the center. 
So now when you put a second atom next to it, you're going to get electrical static force induced resonance. So in the first atom, the electrons start to dance towards your right hand side. Then over here, it becomes slightly electrically positive because of the existence of the nuclei. The second atom will respond to it. Its electron will slightly move to your right hand side. But they will do back and forth motion. Okay. So the nature of dispersion force or the Vanderbilt force in the long range are uh, 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 like the oscillating dipole, uh, uh, induced by oscillating dipole. And that force shall exist as long as electrons are moving. And that's why it's universal for interactions of uh, any uh, matter that is made of uh, uh, atoms. So speaking about that, let me, let me just uh, spend a little bit of time talking about these forces. What's the origin of thermophoretic force? All right. Do you all know what is a Soret effect? That is a critical to many of the laminar flame problem. Light atoms, light molecules, get pulled into the flame, the high temperature region. Okay. Heavy molecules get pushed away into the cold region. Why does that happen? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Thermal diffusion, but what's the origin of a thermal diffusion? Yes, the soretic effect is opposite of thermophysis, but the origin is the same. It's continuity. If light species go that way, by continuity, heavy species must go that way to conserve mass. Okay? So if you explain one, you explain everything. So why do heavy things tend to go to cold area when you expose it to a temperature gradient? Well, it's because, think about that, it's collision induced, right? You have a particle. A little hotter here, a little colder there. The molecules over here is a little hotter, so it gives you two things. A, remember the collision frequency increases as a function of the temperature. You should collide a little more here. But that's not important because you can argue the density because it's hotter is slightly lower. So that compensates. Go to the other side. More important is the gas molecule is a little hotter. So it has a higher kinetic energy and a greater momentum. Each time it gives you a kick harder on this side than on this side. Therefore, heavy molecules always move to the colder side. Does that make sense? All right. Now, this non-rigid uh, body collision has a secondary effect on it because of this interaction. I'll talk about this shortly. So one of the things I, I encourage you to do is that engineering students usually don't think about things beyond an equation given to you, like Fourier's of heat conduction. Well, taking for granted that heat flux is proportional to the temperature gradient and the proportionality is conductivity. We usually don't teach you further than that. But if you want to do well in combustion chemistry, you always have to think one more step, understanding the physics behind it. Thermophysis is a typical example. Okay? And of course, if you, as I said earlier, if a heavy things moving that way by continuity, light things must move that way. So the fact that the Soret <laughs> effect is a consequence, essentially, as heavy things moving towards low temperature, and likewise, you can explain the same thing. Lighter things get bounced back more often than heavy things to the hot side. That's why flame has an effect of focusing light species, hydrogen atom, holding it inside the flame. Okay. All right. Uh, let's talk about the non-rigid sphere. And that is a correction to a hard sphere collision. Uh, in particular, I talked about this earlier. We have the, described the molecular interaction. Those are intra, uh, intermolecular collection. Collision, non-bounding collection, described by 
uh, Lerner Jones uh, potential function. You have a 12th power dependency for the repulsive part, so it's very going up, very steep. steep. You have a 6th power for the attractive London dispersion interaction, and this is the well of potential energy. Okay. And this expression for empirically, for two separate molecules, then you take the mean for collision diameter, and you take the well depth to be geometric mean of, of the both. And the result is an average collision diameter and a well depth. Okay. Now, if you plot this out, you see the potential energy looks like that. In the short range, electron repulsion will raise the potential energy very steeply. In particular, it basically says you can't squeeze two atoms into each other, two molecules into each other, without a bounding interaction. Okay? And that's a very steep wall due to the 12th dependency. In the long range, it's an attractive force. Attractive because if you take the derivative of this potential energy with respect to the separation distance, you get a force. <laughs> This is a positive force. Positive force here refers to interact attraction. Negative force, that's a negative slope here, refers to repulsion. In the long range, of course, when you have the separation distance that's very large, then the air two molecules don't see each other. Okay? So in other words, any collision will have to go <coughs> through this type of potential energy well. So dynamically, it can be envisioned that a hard sphere collision can be viewed as having a step function in potential energy. And this is where the collision corresponds to the collision diameter. Two molecules feel nothing until they touch each other and potential energy shifts to infinity. The correction here is basically to say that if I have Van der Waals interaction, then this has to be extended. I have an attractive part and I have a repulsive part. Okay. And the consequence, of course, is also quite clear if you just think about uh, dynamics of sphere collision. When you have rigid sphere collision, you have no change in trajectory relative to each other. However, if you have a force, in particular an attractive, attractive force in the long range, then as A moving in this direction, B moving in the opposite direction, the attractive force is going to cause the apparent collision cross-section to increase in most cases. A is going to attract the B, so the collision will follow this trajectory. There are also limiting cases that if you just manage this distance, right, this is called the impact factor, typically denoted as a B. If the velocity is just right, you can have B to orbit around A. Okay? And this type of motion is called a grazing collision. Right. And uh, uh, then in other cases, non bounding collision would involve B being swing by through A. Okay? Again, leading to a current increase in collision cross section. So you can treat the dynamics of this problem very carefully. I'll skip this all derivation. If you're interested in it, you can uh, uh, go through my lecture notes and follow the derivation. It's not that hard. And I'm very sure m m many of you had this stuff in your college dynamics class, but you have to do this by vector algebra and, uh, and integral to an extent. So the, the, oh, this is utterly unclear. If you need to do this, oh, this is not that bad. So that, this defines the trajectory of a collision in a relative coordinate system. Let me just go through the end. The end result is you are going to define a reduce the collision integral. Okay. A reduce the collision integral that accounts for impact of temperature and potential energy well depth on the collision cross-section. So reduce the collision integral Long story short, is a correction, a correction term to the actual hard sphere collision cross section. And its value is of order of unity. Okay? And it is equal to unity when you throw away the non rigid body interaction. Okay? 
And uh, uh, in general, if you go to the TRANFIP subroutine, what you will find is that this omega, <coughs> in, which incidentally also impacts diffusion coefficient, is uh, fit into a function of a t reduce the temperature T star, where you only have one parameter that goes in describing this reduce the collision integral, that's the reduce the collision, reduce the temperature, defined here as a KT, T is the actual temperature, divided by the well depth. Okay, and it's all reference between uh, a relative, I can't speak this morning. It is the ra essentially the ratio of the kinetic energy of the molecule, relative, divided by the well depth of interaction. Okay. And going back to uh, then what do you the collision rate constant now will have to be corrected by this uh, uh, reduced the collision integral simply as a multiplier. Okay. Now, before we move further into the next topic, I just want to give you a, 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 a feeling for what are the Leonard John's 12 six potential parameters for represented molecules. Again, S should be sigma, E should be epsilon. So, this is the collision well depth expressed in the unit of a Kelvin, and this is the collision diameter of each molecule. Okay. Hydrogen atom is about a two ounce strong, methane is about a four ounce strong. Okay. And argon, helium, nitrogen are typically about a three ounce strong. Now, be a little careful here. This collision diameter and collision well depths are typically empirical parameters. They are not the actual size or interaction well depth. They are obtained by fitting, usually viscosity data. And for that reason, if you had quantum mechanics, you're going to have to wonder, how would I have a hydrogen atom collision diameter to be equal to two? It doesn't make any sense. What's the boundary lens of H2? 0 0.7, 0 0.8 Armstrong, right? So if it's 0 0.7, 0 0.8 Armstrong between two hydrogen atoms, you multiply this by two, divided by two, you should get about one Armstrong. Where does the two Armstrong come from? <coughs> I'm sorry? You get a higher. Uh, 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 effect coming from that. But the fundamental problem with this description is that there is no f reason why you have a self-interaction self collision diameter can be defined. However, there is no fundamental basis to use the mean for a pair of them. Moreover, there is no fundamental basis to average the well depths by taking the geometric mean. Those are empirical rules. Empirical rules to the extent that, in, in fact, this impact both reaction rate constant de description and the transport description. That's the dirt under the rock for this community. Okay. Ideally, what you want to do is using quantum chemistry code to compute the pair collision diameter, one by one. That's perhaps is the most accurate way to approach that. But watch out, that calculation is excessively difficult. Bounding interaction in quantum chemistry is easy. Non-bounding interaction is harder. Okay. All right. All right, let's talk about potential energy surface. I'm going through this thing very fast. I get you, some of you are a little depressed. <laughs> so if I'm going too fast, slow me down. I don't have to go that far, okay? I'm serious. Yeah, go ahead. A question about, when you say the, the radius, when you're talking about the diameters here, is that of the electron cloud, or is it? It's related to electron cloud. There is an empirical correlation between the size of the electron cloud and 
the collision diameter described in Leonard John's form. Okay, but it's not exact. Doesn't have exact correspondence. We use the example in the electron cloud. The size of it in a hydrogen atom is substantially smaller than two angstrom. Yet after you fit everything, it becomes two angstrom. But on this topic, how do you? Well, I know that we know for sure that this hydrogen atom collision diameter is derived from transport properties. Okay. And how do you do experiment on hydrogen atom determines the transport properties? You can't do it among themselves. They'll react with each other, right? You can't put hydrogen atom into a volume expecting they don't interact with, with each other. So how do you do this experiment? Well, the way you do this is by mixing this with argon. So you cannot determine this property experimentally directly. Moreover, you can't even do a good quantum chemistry calculation to determine these properties because the bonding interaction will overwhelm you. One thing that I forgot to say is bonding interaction forming covalent bond, typically 100 kilocalories per mole of binding energy. That's responsible for the binding of the two atoms. Van der Waals interaction, typically, the well depth is one, one one hundredth of it, about one kilocalorie per mole. Okay? The minute you have a bonding interaction coming in, that one calorie per mole, one kilocalorie per mole at the most, is going to be overwhelmed by this large interaction by bonding. So you can't do the calculation either. So the way how we do that is we mix. Uh, hydrogen atom with argon. Well, we don't mix hydrogen atom with argon. We mix a precursor of a hydrogen atom with argon in a flow tube. You set up a laser doing photolysis. You generate a pocket of hydrogen <coughs> atom. You flow this gas downstream, and you watch the broadening. Okay, you watch the broadening of a hydrogen atom. And when you do that, you can back out the diffusivity. From the diffusivity, you use chapman inskop theory to back out the collision diameter. And you, then you say, well, I know the collision diameter of argon. I'll back out this value to be that. So this whole thing is empirical. As a matter of fact, there are quite many problems. This table is by far completely empirical in my mind, and there's no basis. There are many things in science works like that. Back in the 60s, when Dixon Lewis compiled a table like this, I don't know anything about ray constant. And I don't even know the thermochemistry of hydroxyl radical. So who cares about this? If I'm off by 10%, 20%, 30%, that uncertainty is substantially smaller than any other uncertainty. <coughs> so let me just stuff a table into the calculation. I'll worry about this problem later. Later, the Sandia group made it a Kempkin code, and all this stuff got thrown into the code as a database called a tra transport database, right? Now, that transport database was taken as a Bible, so to speak, an appendix of a Bible. But you never think that those values ought to be challenged. And that's one of them. Transporter coefficients today is a bigger mass than 50 years ago. Why? Because the kinetics is getting better and better. So transport for 50 years, we have now never done anything to it already. So if you look at this number, just, you know, if you have a little time, just look into this number. For example, why is a methyl having a collision diameter bigger than methane? Do you have a basis for that? How about a methylene, CH2? Why is the CH2 bigger than methane over here? OK? These are the values that you're using for your flame calculation. All right. I'll get to that hopefully tomorrow on this uh, uh, another topic about transport uncertainties. Is, is there a range where those values are? You know, you said they're compared to the fit. Is there some range where we say, OK, in this temperature or this pressure range, these are more valid, for instance, in some other extreme? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. In general, you cannot determine transport coefficients at a 1,400 Kelvin. 
temperature is too high, things are going to have to react. So what you do is that you do the measurement at a very low <coughs> temperature, room temperature. You use chapman yuskov theory to extrapolate this to high temperature. Now the chapman yuskov theory is enormously successful theory. Okay, on its own, it's rigorous. But when you apply the theory, you're going to have to use empirical constant, like what we see here. So the validity of high temperatures is unknown. You have no experiment. You cannot do experiment to even verify it. Okay, that's another challenge that if one of you can come up with a good device, good method to derive transport coefficients at a high temperature, that's going to be a major contribution to combustion chemistry. There have been some study back in the later 70s using molecular beam to do collision cross-section measurement. You do one collision at a time, you determine the collision cross-section that way. But uh, so far, no really good useful thing have come out of this, other than a few collisions, pairs that involve small molecules. Okay. And the other thing you have to remember is, we're all interested in biofuel, right? Biodiesel or large molecules. Those collision <coughs> parameters are tip, uh, essentially spherical potentials. In other words, <coughs> they're all like spheres. When you get to endodecane, you have a long chain. How do you describe its diffusivity? How do you describe its collision well depth? You don't have a spherical potential, like the Leonard Jones. What is its average collision diameter? When a molecule becomes very long, you're going to have Brownian rotation start to play a role. If you have a flow, OK? especially at a high temperature. The main feed pass of the gas at a room temperature, one atmospheric pressure is 70 nanometer, right? Let's go to 10 atmosphere. The main free <coughs> pass becomes 7 nanometer. You go to 1,500 Kelvin, the main free pass shrink again to about the size or the length of the NLK, NLK molecule. Go put yourself into that condition. What would an NLK molecule transport? You provide a convective flow. I have a stick. Remember that my main free pass is now at the size of the stick length. How do you transport the species? Throw a stick into a little creek. What is, how does this stick, stick is move with the creek? First of all, if you orient it, in the direction perpendicular to the stream flow, you will reorient itself, right? That's the least resistance for it to go. Moreover, because the creek wanders about, the sticker will have to undergo some sort of browning rotation. So now if you take a long chain molecule, put it into a flame, it's not going to behave like a sphere. It's going to behave like a stick, especially at high pressure, high temperature. And if you have a flow, it probably is going to orient itself along the flow and doing run-in rotation. Do we know the diffusivity under this situation? No, we don't, because chapman yuskov theory essentially assumes my collision is spherical, hot sphere, or spherical, not hot sphere, elastic. All right? Those are the things that I'm pretty sure Dixon Lewis knew back in the 60s. And he said, I just deal worry about a hydrogen system. And it doesn't matter. Now we're getting into such a large few systems. Watch out. Go back to the assumption we made then. Alrighty. So if you ask me at a fundamental level, how much do we really know about large field combustion chemistry? Very little. And personally, I'm getting increasingly uncomfortable to dwell into kinetic rate parameters without looking at some of the transport problems or the assumptions that went into the governing equation. After all, these governing equations are what facilitate us 
to compare model prediction against the experiment. But if your governing equations are questionable, you're going to have to question the comparison. <coughs> All right, that's side story. I didn't mean to have this long discussion. You want to talk about this more? I know I flipped the order, but I was planning to do transport theory, uh, Chapman-Inskov theory tomorrow briefly, but now I swap it around because <coughs> I understand that uh, uh, not everyone <coughs> will understand how transport property diffusivity viscosity is determined. I just want to make a statement that this table is shared uh, among kinetics for determining hard sphere collision, excuse me, uh, for determining collision uh, frequency, and is also used <coughs> for determining collisional stabilization in a chemically activated problem, and is also used for transport properties. Should I move on? Okay. All right, let's talk about potential energy of bonding interaction. Okay. We will do that on the simplest bimolecular reaction possible. That is the reaction between a hydrogen atom with an H2 molecule. However, to make the story little clear, I replaced the hydrogen atom by its cousin, that's the deuterine atom. Already. Deuterine atom comes in, grab it in the hydrogen atom, kick out the second one. All right. Other than the fact that the mass of a deuterine and a hydrogen being different, the electronic structure of the two atoms are completely identical. So the potential energy that you show C is identical, whether this is deuterine or hydrogen atom. Okay. So think about this process. How does it take place? I have the one hydrogen atom here. Sorry, it's asymmetric. One hydrogen atom here, this is another one. I have a deuterine atom comes in, colliding one hydrogen atom over here. That translational energy is transformed into vibration energy here. I kick here, send energy through this bonding interaction, kick away the hydrogen atom over there. Most of the time, this collision is not going to be successful. Either the orientation is not right, or not enough energy to do that. For example, if the deuterine comes from the top, collide here, then you're going to have to go for a spin. Now transforming energy in the right direction. Okay. Other times, you don't have enough translation of energy to kick out this hydrogen atom. So you have a more or less close to an elastic collision, and then you move away. OK? That's the dynamics. Meanwhile, you have one more motion that's going on. That is symmetric stretch. As this atom comes in, whether it determines whether it's in phase or out of phase, you're going to get another vibration or come to this shortly. So we shall define the reaction coordinate by Looking at the detailed dynamics of this potential energy, I have two independent variables here that I'm interested in. One is the hydrogen-hydrogen distance. The other is the hydrogen-deuterine distance. This wiggly thing, e roughly equal, should have been Armstrong. I don't know what happened uh, when we get to the printer. So this is the Armstrong. Now, if you increase both the hydrogen-hydrogen distance, the hydrogen-deuterine distance, you are moving towards that corner. This represents a dissociation of H2. When all three atoms are <coughs> far apart, all obviously potential energy must arise. This corner representing you are squeezing the deuterine atom into H2 molecule. Again, you cannot form H3. There's not enough electrons to do that. So you go up in a potential energy in this quarter, too. The proper reaction coordinate follows the valley. You're moving around this valley. Okay. During that process, 
if you start with the deuterium atom approaching one of the two hydrogen atoms at a larger distance, the potential energy start to increase. In doing so, the HH separation have to increase too as deuterium approaches the first hydrogen atom. Can you visualize that? When deuterium goes in, shrinking the deuterium hydrogen atom distance, and in doing so, you're kicking the second hydrogen atom out by increasing the bound separation distance between the two hydrogen atoms. So that's the valley for which the reaction is going to take place. Rock's flat. It's not flat. There's a barrier. There's a barrier going from here, over here, and down here. So if you expand this region, you're going to see a very, very steep uh, valley that potential energy uh, 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 has a local maximum, okay? In chemical kinetics, we call this as the saddle. If you look left, look right, you can see steep hills. You look front, you look at the back, you're going down. So that's a saddle where you sit on, okay? The appropriate reaction coordinate is around the saddle. And the other way to represent this type of potential energy surface is just to do a contour diagram where the blue represents low energy, the red represents high energy. So you take this three-dimension view, project it onto the bottom plane, and color code it. And that's the reaction path. This is the point where the energy is the highest along this minimum energy path. And that's a saddle point. Now, you may wonder, why did I use a wiggly line here rather than a straight line, rather than, 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 than uh, what is a wiggly doing here? That wiggly line essentially represents the other vibrational degree of freedom. Okay? You are moving in this direction, but at the same time, you also wonder about on this potential energy well. That motion, is orthogonal to the reaction direction. <coughs> you cannot kill it. That's the inherent vibration of the molecule. So if you really look at how reaction takes place, then indeed, from potential energy standpoint, you are moving around like that, across the barrier. Okay. Then typically what we do is, once we find this reaction coordinate, if we can define it, usually along some sort of a normal coordin coordinate of vibration. And we can plot things like that. Now, this is the minimum energy path along the valley. I start from my reactant, then I have my product here. Okay? It must pass through here a critical structure that's at the top of the saddle point. Now, here, the minimum energy over here isn't the top of the hill from the standpoint of electronic energy. You're going to have to add zero point of vibration. Remember? Even at a zero degree Kelvin, you still have the lowest uh, uh, mode of vibration uh, 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 active. So you add this part of vibrational energy, and that's what you have to overcome. Already. So what if I have to deal with an arbitrary reaction, A, B plus C? Here, the very fact that I have symmetric potential energy is because the nature of a deuterine from the standpoint of electrons is identical to hydrogen. The minute that you go to other system, this potential <coughs> energy function is not going to be symmetric. Okay. Forgot to say that. This is what we call the critical energy. It's related to activation energy, but it's not exactly that. I'll show what I mean by that. If you go for an arbitrary reaction, A, B plus C, forming this transition state structure. This is the first time I introduced the word transition state structure. And transition state structure typically, not always, is the saddle point structure. 
producing product. I destroy the symmetry. I can provide an arbitrary potential energy, but there are two types. Along this reaction coordinate, I have A, B plus C. Adding to get combined together, this system has its own zero point energy. So is the product. A plus B, C has its zero point energy. The solid thick line refers to electronic energy. Okay. And then you have the saddle also have its zero point energy. So the potential you really needed to watch about is this dotted line, unfortunately. All right. This is for an exothermic reaction in that the products have higher potential energy than the reactants. The forward barrier is denoted as E0F. The back reaction barrier is denoted as E0B. Obviously, the forward barrier subtracted by the back barrier is reaction enthalpy that is 0 Kelvin. Recall I said earlier, reaction enthalpies are basically potential energy. That's what I mean. Okay. Enthalpy at an elementary level is related to the barrier of chemical reactions. On this side, we have an exothermic reaction. In other words, the total potential energy lies below the total potential energy of the reactants. You have to go over barrier. In this case, the enthalpy of reaction is equal to E0F minus E0B. It's a negative value that's consistent with the fact that an exothermic reaction gives you negative enthalpy of reaction. Okay. All right, just a couple of things. I go back to the equilibrium constant. I take a forward ray constant divided by back ray constant. That's equal to equilibrium constant. Now, here's something that I wanted to describe. Uh, Peter asked me the other day, and there's also something that I was, when I was a student, I never understood it. What I didn't understand was that when, I, when we derived <coughs> this expression, we used the equilibrium assumption, right? We say chemical reaction get to equilibrium. This is how I define the equilibrium constant. <coughs> if I have A plus B e forward back reaction, okay, under equilibrium, then the rates of production are all go to zero. So I have KF times concentration of A and B at equilibrium is equal to KB times the concentration of <coughs> C and D at equilibrium. It would, as if, indicate <coughs> under equilibrium condition. This expression is valid, right? Then we said, well, look at here. This is how we define equilibrium constant from thermodynamics. Through that relation, we said equilibrium constant is equal to the ratio of a Kf over Kb. That middle step threw me off for a very long time. I said, wait a second. Aren't you saying this relationship is applicable only in the equilibrium condition? What happened to non-equilibrium condition? Should they still be applicable? The answer is that it does. Why? I'm sorry? Kf and Kb are not dependent on you. That's right. The argument here is very simple. Both, neither Kf nor Kb depends on the concentration of the reactants or the product. They are property of a reaction, independent of what concentration you should have. Therefore, the beauty of this whole thing is that as long as you prove this is to be the case under one condition, it must be applicable under all conditions. Okay? That is the argument. And for that reason, it's always correct. <coughs> all right, going back to this issue. If I take now uh, an Arrhenius expression, 
I'm diverging a little bit. I wanted to show what are these A factors and what are the activation energy. If I take an Arrhenius expression and express this into in the form of equilibrium constant, I get this expression. You have the ratio of A factor, and you have the difference of activation energy. Let me assume the stoichiometric coefficients. It's a biomolecular reaction, A plus B going to C plus D. So in that case, Kc is Kp. And plug in the Gibbs free energy of reaction, expand it into enthalpy of reaction and entropy. And separate them again. Then if you compare this expression with that expression, you realize that the A factors of a rate constant have something to do with reaction entropy. Whereas the activation energy have something to do with reaction enthalpy. A factor is a measure of something during the reaction process, the entropy process. The activation energy is related to the potential energy of interaction. Okay. And that's just an experiment expanding this, that's it, the entropy relationship for A factor. And this is a long equation, don't derive it, don't just go through quickly. What I'll, at the end, what you find is that the activation energy for the forward reaction is essentially equal to the energy barrier, critical energy in the forward direction, but you have to correct it by the sensible enthalpy. Therefore, inherently, Activation energy are temperature dependent. Okay? Same is for the back reaction. And as for that reason, at the thermodynamic level, you'll realize that Arrhenius law is an empirical law. There's no such thing as a constant activation energy. That temperature dependency can be very weak. That's got buried, and it can be easily get buried when you do the fitting. But fundamentally, <coughs> there's no reason to expect an activation energy to be a constant. Okay. Yeah. What is when is the proof of the activated complex is formed? I'm sorry? Is there a proof that the activated complex is formed? <coughs> a proof that activated a complex. I mean, I understand that the balance of energy is work out because you're measuring from from certain level, right? Oh, can we follow the complex? Okay. Or rather, in order to detect the complex, you're going to have to follow the whole reaction process. Why? After all, this is a vibration phenomenon. And we talked about this yesterday. The time scale for a typical vibration process is around hundreds of a femtosecond. So that's a very short event. And indeed, the the fame of uh, Akhmat Zawel, do you know him? Got a Nobel Prize for doing femtosecond spectroscopy. Before that, it was Yang Li uh, from Berkeley, did a picosecond spectroscopy. Picosecond wasn't enough to follow the reaction process, but femtosecond, you can do it. And indeed, the nature of a transition state has been probed by femtosecond spectroscopy. And that and led to at least the one Nobel Prize. Okay. So it has been proven that it exists. But keep in mind that the transition state is a dynamic transition state. It does not exist. You see, nothing can exist for a very long lifetime. And you don't poke with it, it will stay there forever. But transition state is not a stable molecule. You look left, you look right, <coughs> you have to fall off this potential energy well. Okay? And as a result, it never, can never exist for longer than perhaps even a big femtosecond. How is the energy of this complex measured? I mean, how do you know that where the well is or the pattern? How do you measure it? In uh, traditional reaction kinetics, uh, you basically measure reaction rate constant. 
using an argument I made to back out deriving energy barrier from activation energy. Okay, and there are ways to do that. And later, there are molecular beam experiments. You're colliding a beam of a molecule with another, and you can determine the energy barrier through manipulating the kinetic energy of the two beams. Okay. You can even uh, define a beam of a molecule having rotational energy equal to such, vibrational e energy equal to that, then the collide. The problem is that uh, uh, those from microscopic ray constant of known rotational energy, vibration energy to <coughs> thermal energy ray constants down long distance to go. Okay. More recently, we've relied on quantum chemistry calculation to determine those barriers. Okay. Hopefully, I'll, I'll talk about this tomorrow. Okay. Because I was thinking that you can't measure the temperature there because you don't know if it's an internal equilibrium or not. No. So no. Anything that you learned about equilibrium so this of thermodynamics falls apart. And this reaction is, after all, a perturbation of that. Okay. Let me move, move on with this. Then there is a relationship between the potential energy surface and the molecular vibration. We talked about that. A well, two, bond, two molecules connected by a bond, undergoing oscillation. That process can be approximated as a harmonic interaction, okay, with a quadratic uh, potential function. So, let me long story short, let me, let me just jump through this a little bit. Then if you remember that the vibration frequency for harmonic oscillation, the frequency of it is related to what? Is determined by what? If you have a steep well, compared to a, a shallow round well. You throw a ball into it, it goes oscillating, right? Which one would have the higher frequency for the same kinetic energy, for the same total energy? All right, I'm losing you guys a little bit, so let's not do any math. <laughs> let's describe the whole thing just phenomenologically. Okay. If I have a steep, well, potential energy well versus a shallow well. I put a ball inside. This assuming there's no friction. So you're gonna constantly do this back and forth vibration. Okay. Assuming I have the same amplitude of vibration, not amplitude, energy, total energy of vibration. Which one has a high frequency? Deep Obviously deep. that one, right? Yeah. It's gonna go really fast. This is a flappy motion back <coughs> and forth, right? And the vibration frequency here is proportional to what? What characteristics of this potential energy give me vibration frequency? <coughs> it's a second derivative of potential energy, right? So this is proportional to d squared v dr squared. And you remember if you did your dynamics, this is the square root of it. So I have the derivation somewhere there, so don't stare at them. I'm pretty sure that you're tired of it. It follows that for a well, this V is positive definite. <coughs> However, if you go into the top of a hill, the second derivative would be negative, right? This has a positive first derivative. This has a zero derivative, zero first derivative at the bottom but that first derivative continue to increase as you're going in this direction. Therefore, the second derivative is positive. This is the opposite. You have a zero first derivative and at the top, but the passing that point, you're going downhill. So the derivative becomes from positive to negative. So the second derivative must be negative. So what you see here is the vibration motion Pathing initially going from the well to the top to the well. You are basically looking at a vibration motion with frequency going from positive definite to imaginary. Why? When the second derivative is negative, the frequency becomes imaginary. 
So during the reaction process, passing through the top of a hill, you essentially lost the bone vibration. It <coughs> went to where? It went to translation. That interpretation is to say that if you look at a triatomic linear motion, when I hit this into the deuterine atom, initially into the hydrogen atom, hydrogen molecule, if they form bonding of some type, then I'm closing this two atom, but I'm elongating this bond. So from a triatomic interaction standpoint, I'm doing an asymmetric stretch. Right? If you think about that, I'm doing this. Except now, when it de-kicks this too hard, you come at the top of barrier. At the top of barrier, because the potential is symmetric for this particular case, the lens up here is the same as that. Passing this point, you form the DH bond, kicking the H bond out. So what I, we are, the new interpretation here is that this process is by nature a vibrational motion. Yet for reaction to occur at the top of that hill, that vibration turned itself into a translational motion. Because after all, it started from a translation motion, ends with a translation motion itself. The end of the translation motion is kicking the hydrogen atom out. Does that make sense? All right. I know you, I see you're all confused. <laughs> I'm confused too. This is the first time I try to explain transition state theory in 15 minutes, and I see I'm not doing well. But anyhow, let's move on. Is this a representation of what we think is actually happening? Or I mean, is it, or is this just a convenient way of? This is actually what's happening. This is actually what's happening. Okay, this is actually what's happening. Most of the time, D e is going to collide with H. Nothing happens because you're not can't get over the barrier. You roll a ball, bowling ball up on the hill. You can't go over the barrier. So you roll back. Roll back means the D comes and move away. You kick this hydrogen out hard enough, and this is going to go away. Meanwhile, it's not ideal. It's not ideal in the sense that D does not have to align itself along the HH bond. You can come this way. So you have a couple of the motion now of rotation. Okay, And you also have introduced the bending. And adding on top of it, you have symmetric stretch going on at the same time. And the three motions are perpendicular to the reacting motion. Okay. They will contribute, they'll, they, they'll share this energy, making sure reaction doesn't happen or impede the reaction process because once energy goes there, it doesn't go into that. Alrighty. But this is, in fact, the detail that it dynamic standpoint is indeed how reaction takes place. So could you induce, for instance, rotation and lower the ability for reaction to take place because you have some additional form of motion that makes it more difficult to react? Ah. We are getting tired of this stuff, so let's talk about this. This is related to, uh, that's an interesting question. So. Let me tell you this short story. Last night, uh, uh, Professor Law said, well, I can't go out to dinner with you guys, but uh, go have fun. I'm paying for it. So I said, OK. <laughs> There's a condition. You guys have to come up with 10 grand challenges for combustion science over dinner. I'll buy a really good bottle of wine. Guess what? The number one challenge we came up with was how do you do fast reaction kinetics and fast fuel oxidation at the low temperature? You say how low? As low as possible, room temperature. Why? After all, you realize what you're doing is turning, transforming chemical energy into mechanical energy, right? If you have reaction exosomicity, 
This exhaust humidity, once it goes into heat, you're bound by Carnot cycle now. You're turning chemical enthalpy into random motion. You then ask random motion to do useful work for you. That's the reason why I'm always limited by the Carnot cycle. All right, so one of the ways to minimize the impact of a Carnot cycle is to lower the temperature. But if you lower the temperature, reaction becomes too slow. So you ask the question, well, can we do something about rotational motion? And we make sure when the two molecules collide with each other, we'll cheat the nature, making sure to react. And it react at a lower temperature. How do we do that? How do we make the energy barrier of H plus O2 chip branching, lowering it from 16 kilocalorie per mole down to two? 16 is a fundamental parameter. You can have to apply. Yeah, go ahead. No, That's one way. Say catalyst, yeah. Catalyst, all right, let's look, talk about the catalyst. Let's talk about the catalyst. Speaking about that, that's very interesting. Let's talk about it. So one way to avoid thermal energy is to make sure A, reaction has to occur at a low temperature. First condition, that's necessary. If you have to go to high temperature to do reaction process, then you must supply heat. That heat is chemical enthalpy. So you have to do low temperature reaction. Okay? You said, well, we manipulate the energy barrier by do, introducing catalyst. But if you introduce a catalyst, the reaction products fly all over the place. And if they fly all over the place, that's in the form of thermal energy. Random motion. Now you want to take this random motion into work, useful work. It's difficult. You have to pay a price, right? So the two conditions for us to get around the Carnot cycle is imagine I have a surface. And I have the reaction to take place over here. I have a catalyst reduce the energy barrier. But I wanted to make sure that all the products formed initially stay on the surface. And I found a way to tilt the potential energy of the surface of all molecules working in that direction. Well, if you provide a potential energy, these molecules are hot, right, locally. And with the potential energy tilted, they must work in this direction. How to be able to, <coughs> at the end, the molecule fall off the edge, there's nothing there. If you can tune this potential energy locally to the point that all molecules, after they leave the surface, go straight line. Now, the temperature of this molecule might be very low. Temperature is a measure of random motion. And this trajectory now turning all translational energy in one direction. What is that? You are doing expansion, gas expansion. How does gas turbine work? Expansion, isentropic expansion, is basically you're trying to turn thermal energy into directional motion of molecules, all in one direction, right? You take a heat, random motion, and put all this into one direct, I'm not very good at this, but I can't describe it. <laughs> All into directional motion. This directional motion push the turbine, right? Can you directly do this with a reaction? If you can, you bypass the heat. There's a third condition. This catalyst the surface material must be the one that does not exchange heat with the gas molecule on the top, absorb it on the top. If it dissolves on the top, then the kinetic energy, well, the surface doesn't care. The molecules are moving in one direction on the surface or randomly on the surface. If there's energy, they will suck it up. If you can satisfy the three conditions, you bypass Carnot cycle, you're going to be able to turn chemical energy directly into mechanical, bypassing heat. 
Any idea? How do we do that? I'm sorry? Well, fuel cell, you, have, you turn chemical energy into electrical. That's why you bypass the karma. But electrical energy has to be turned back into mechanical energy, right? Efficiency is high. But can we even bypass that? Forget it about making an electrical current. We'll directly do this by chemical reaction. Can you build, um, what is it, the carbon nanotubes that are so small that only single molecules will go through? Could you do something if you needed to orient them all, for instance, in the same direction? Mm -hmm. You might be able to do it by flowing through some kind of nanotube array. That's possible. Absolutely possible. And the other way, you know, let me let me just split this problem into a couple of pieces. How do I design an actual material surface that gave rise to a downhill potential energy on a molecule, on a molecule that's going to absorb the ion? In principle, it's possible. Okay, it's possible. All what you have to do is you start from this side stronger interacting material over this side, light interacting material. And all what you have, you, you cannot do a flat potential energy surface. That doesn't exist. What you can do is sites that bonds like that. Okay? So the molecules by random motion will have to hop, right? Now you guide their hopping only in that direction, so it will go over there and shoot out in one direction. And a molecular level, if you can use a molecular nozzle, if this atom gets spit out, it must spit out in one direction. Now, I don't want to say too much now. Think about this. One of you had asked that, is there a Nobel Prize in energy conversion? You figure out how to do that, the three criteria. A, fast reaction. B, construct a potential energy surface so that the molecules, the products, with the kinetic energy gained from enthalpy release all moving in one direction. And at the end, it will shoot out of the surface in a straight line in a directional that can be guided. And no heat transfer with the subject. Four things. You deserve five Nobel Prize. <laughs> Tunneling is like inherent property of particular molecule. I'm sorry? Atom. Potent tunneling through potential atom. Oh, you, you can do anything. You can do tunneling. You can do anything you want. OK. All right. At the end, remember, what we are doing, well, despite all this transition state theory and stuff, this is not important. At the end, our job is how to turn, convert chemical energy efficiently to mechanical energy. The rest of the world don't look us seriously because they hated the Carnot cycle. Who, who likes Carnot? A brilliant man, yet what he described is basically the fact that at the statistical mechanical level, the way how we convert energy is a rather dumb way to do it. You take chemical energy, turn into heat. That's the most useless energy, form of energy. Then you turn that into work. And remember, heat is random motion. If at the end of a reaction, you can, you can eliminate this random motion, guide all the products of the reaction in one spatial direction, you bypass Carnot cycle. All right? Caution you that if you want to work on this idea, again, go back to statistical thermodynamics first, making sure you're not violating the second law of thermodynamics. That annoying fact. <laughs> All right, it gives you a clue whether a process you wanted to design can work or not. All right, let's take a break earlier. I'm, I know that I'm boring you. I don't know what to do with the remaining part of the stuff. It's all very demanding. But maybe we can talk about the uh, transition state theory in the context of this potential energy stuff.
So we'll come back 10.30. Is that a fine?